Okay, everybody. Uh, let's let's get started. Let me switch the music to something a little less. So what's what's better for for entry? There we go. Nah. Uh. Oh, there we go. I, I'm good with that. So, wait, is that me? My my volume. Let me lower my gain. My gain might be a bit much. How's that? Yeah, I just changed audio settings. Oh, seriously? How about now? Max up the mic volume. How about that? <laughs> okay, so I did I did mess with the audio balance since last time since I noticed a lot of noise and crackling and stuff like that. A bit more of a pop my guys. Okay, just, just one decibel of game. One decibel one. Wait for thin. How am I doing now? Still too quiet? R rubber banding between too quiet and, and ear splitting. Oh my god. Okay. Eh, one more decibel. I really wish decibels weren't in some sort of logarithmic scale, then I'd know what I was doing. How's that? Yeah, I think we're good anyway. So, uh, I think at this point, there's, if it's either working or it's not, let's just go ahead and get started. More. Oh my goodness. One more. Okay, now we're gonna get started. Alright. So... I, I, th I think this is probably uh, here, one, one more and then and then I'll actually get to what I wanted to talk about today. Try to protect your speakers from getting blown out. Okay, anyway, um, it's the end of the contest. Uh, voting is done, polls are closed, and as it turns out, uh, we we've had a quick conversation. Oh my goodness, still? Let me, let me, let me... Put the music down by a lot. There we go. Music's down to half. Okay, can I be heard now? This is what I get for, for trying to adjust my volume off stream. Okay. So, the uh, contest is closed. Uh, however, there was some uh, irregularity with the voting. So, uh, let me just go ahead and get through the whole story, and then I'll tell you the, the conclusion of it is... Uh, We'll, we'll get to that. So uh, I announced the competition and I make my submission uh, basically on the morning of uh, New Year. Basically, instead of celebrating New Year, I'm, I'm cramming to get my game done. Uh, I believe we do the announcement stream. Uh, when was it? Yeah, basically like the day of, I think it was either Thursday or Friday. It might have been just Friday. Um. So we do that. We get the voting started. And on Friday afternoon, evening, uh, Saturday, uh, not even Friday afternoon, I think it was like Friday morning. So I think I did the stream on Wednesday or Thursday. Friday, votes explode. And we're not seeing any downloads on the uh, the forum post. And there's no new signups for the forum or anything like that. So no one's actually downloading the game. However, overnight, Kai Dash's game, Blood Stigma, gets like... 20 some, 30 some votes, and Blitz blowing everyone out of the water. Eventually, Z Dream catches up a little bit, and everyone else has some votes file in. I vote for myself. I think Shane probably voted for me, and I think I got one more vote from some someone who's generous or whatever. Uh, I didn't do a lot of self promotion for this one. Uh, Ponut got a few votes. VBT kind of crept up slowly over the whole time. But the point was. Oh, you voted for Z-Tree. Okay, two other people voted for me. I don't know. Um, but, but, I mean, honestly, Z-Tree kind of deserved the votes more than I did. Uh, so I'm not mad about that. The issue was that games were getting votes that looked like it was based entirely either off of screenshots and, and, and worse, it looked like particular games were getting a lot of votes in a very short amount of time. Like... 
the majority of Blood Stigma's votes came from one day's worth of voting. Uh, it didn't sit well with me, but I didn't want to do anything about it, and I wanted to just see if more votes could come in. I posted the competition in various places, and the idea was that we get the competition entries out there. We have people come to the forum, download the games, try them out, actually. We'll have pseudo-Saturns. Uh, the game should be built with uh, pseudo-Saturn, uh, uh, a bit, you know, pseudo-Saturn, uh, ability to, to run on Super Saturn, which is a special flag in Joe Engine, but it's doable. Uh, if, if you have, like, a G or was, what's the G? The Rhea, or the Phoebe, or what have you, or for the handful of people out there, the Fenrir, or for the beta testers, the Sadiators, uh, they should be all playable on them. So people, presumably, would be able to burn discs, or download to SD, or even run an emulator, which is, uh, not too, too hard to set up. Uh, if you just, uh, you know, download a build of Mendefen, I think I've distributed one out already. And people were meant to play the games and try them out. We're seeing almost no downloads and a bunch of votes. And we see that the original game competition, uh, receiving 85 votes by the end of it, uh, and then you look at the translation hacks, which did not have any sort of pod attached to it, received 45 votes. Now, on top of this, after the first couple days, we're saying, hey, this voting pattern is really weird. So at some odd hour at that overnight, some, a whole bunch of votes just came in from people that didn't actually visit the forum. What's going on? So, uh, we do a quick uh, sanity check and we do some unofficial polls. Now, the unofficial poll uh, for the uh, original game competition came kind of came out the way I expected the actual competition to come out. Uh, the more completed, polished three games would co obviously come out on top. The games that were uh, kind of complete... Well, I guess only me and Diddy got votes. I voted for myself, obviously. So the majority of the votes basically went to the polished 3D games that were playable and ready to be finished. Uh, obviously, these votes are not as generous as the full competition because there's not as many people participating. But this is the distribution we kind of were expecting. For the hacks and patches category, uh, there's a switch between Sakura and Grandia, which is kind of expected for the different demographic between general audience and homebrew audience who have different tastes in games but overall this what this told me is that this distribution which wasn't too far off from this distribution told me that this poll is probably correct but this poll looks like it's had some outside influence now we've had a lot of conversations uh we didn't accuse anyone of anything and we don't believe anyone that actually participated in the competition is guilty of anything wrong and what it ended up happening is that kai dash looked at the votes, said, you know what, it doesn't feel right to me either, I want to step down. And that was very early on. I said, Kaidesh, let's just wait, let's just see the, let the votes come in and see what happens. Come to today, we revisit the conversation. The votes still look a little bit off. The voting patterns still look like almost robotic. Like, the, the Blood Stigma has been almost consistently plus four, plus five votes on top of XL2's game almost the entire time. It was weird to me. And we all agreed that the fact that there's almost no visits to the forums, almost no downloads, way too many votes, the timing of the votes and the distribution of the votes is a little bit off. Uh, we, we didn't like how it was sitting. It didn't feel right for some of these entries to be voted higher than certain other entries when we all had kind of had a consensus of we know which games are playable and have more content. And we feel, as a community, even those that enter the competition feel Oh yeah, I, I acknowledge that XL2's game is better than my game. I acknowledge that Ponet's game is better than my game. Why is this distribution like this? Um, on top of that, uh, BBT decided that he didn't like the attention that his tech demo was getting on top of uh, other games, or how close it was getting to the level of, say, you know, the more complete games like, like Project Z Dream, so he decided to back out, and then XL2 said, well, I don't want to win by default. Uh, it doesn't seem right, so he's going to back out. So essentially, the cash prizes that were going to the top three places all backed out of the competition. They don't want uh, they don't want to win the way that this poll is going on. I don't want to default to the unofficial polls because I specifically stated this is just a sanity check. I just want to see what's going on. So, what we're going to do? Uh, we have decided to. Uh, not throw away the results, we'll still record the results, but we'll say, we'll call it a wash, we'll say, thank you everyone for contributing. Instead, the prize pool is going to the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. 
Now, if you're not aware, um, the uh, this is a current image of what it looks like to live in Australia right now. There is a massive brush fire uh, going on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I, I didn't even see that VBT added your name on the list just by, just by, uh, I, I don't know, just under the radar, I didn't even notice it. Yeah, so no, this is what happens when a big chunk of your country is on fire and all day and all night it's burning for weeks and weeks and weeks. So even at night, the, the sky is glowing red. This is what it looks like in New South Wales. If, if you go uh, boat off the coast, it still looks like that. It's actually been a, been an issue for the Sadie Eater project, of which I'm a beta tester of, because uh, Professor Abrasive has not been able to go back to his home. It, it, the, they closed down the airports. It's not been safe to visit. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we say, okay, we don't like where the competition's going. We've got all this prize pool money that I promised to give out. I'm not going to keep it for myself. Let's put that promised prize pool money. And we all agreed, yeah, we, we like this cause. Let's give it to the uh, fire service. So New South Wales uh, Rural Fire Service. There is a link down below uh, in the Twitch panel. There will be a link down below on the YouTube when I upload this. I've already downloaded all $40 worth of the prize pool toward uh, the fire service to try and help out uh, with uh, the Australian brush fire crisis. Uh, I'd encourage all of you uh, to go ahead and make a donation of your own. And I feel like this is the best way for us to try and make good of an otherwise sketchy looking situation. Now, if you want me to just run down the, the list of winners as they would have been based off the polls, uh, first place was uh, Blood Stigma by Kaidash, second place uh, Project Z Tree by XL2, third place The Tech Demo from VBT, fourth place Untitled Pony Game by Ponut, fifth place uh, Forsaken Plane, my game. And then tied for 6th place are 12 Snakes by uh, Slinga and Rossi's Classic by Cobra Dial. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Fulkin's Mazinger Z didn't get any votes, but I feel like that's because it didn't get pushed very hard and it was uh, kind of a last minute uh, entry that nobody really saw coming. Um, as far as the Hacks, Packs, and Translations category, uh, Sakura Wars came out on top, and it's probably a lot to do with the fact that it's a new release. It just, in mid-December, came out that as the new translation. Everyone's had a chance to play Grandia already, uh, so that's why the disparity is. But I feel like they're both equally valid, uh, good translations. Uh, Trekkies Unite has worked on both of them, but Noah Steam is, is the one uh, basically kind of running the project for Sakura Wars, so he would be uh, considered the, the winner for this category. Uh... Trekkies Unite participated uh, with two different games, Grandia and uh, the Castle of Illusion Quackshot port. Uh, I love Mickey Mouse, I love Donald Duck. And uh, VBT's uh, emulator for essentially all the pre-Genesis uh, Sega consoles, the FBA, came in the third. Oh, seriously? Like, let me, let me, let me bump it back down a little bit more. I mean, to be honest, this, this music probably isn't great anyway, so let's skip it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bump it down a little bit. So, yeah. that That's that's what the entries would have been. I don't want to declare any official winners because we all did decide that the polls were a little bit too sketchy. So, uh, we are going to say... The, the thread is up. If you want to go and actually try out the game... You can create an account on uh, the Sega Z Stream for or Extreme Forum. Sorry, Sega Extreme Forums. Uh, all the games and some of the source codes are available. Um, so so you can see uh, how how a lot of these games are made. How Forsaken Plane was made, for example, which is probably a decent base if you ever wanted to get into 2D RPG stuff on the Saturn. Um, as far as the translations, there's uh, there's a little bit of uh, working that has to be done in order to get the patch and apply it to the ISO properly and, and put it up. Um, I'll probably post a guide for that later if, if I feel like it or if anyone asks. Um, but for now, uh, we just want to say you close out the competition. We're thankful that everyone that participated, we had uh, a lot of entries. This is probably the size of this competition rivals that of the old Rock and V competitions from about over a decade ago. So we're going to do this again. Next year, uh, we're going to have a panel of judges from the Sega Z Extreme, or Extreme community. I keep saying Z Extreme. Sega Extreme community who have experience 
making homebrew or at least have have a name in the community so they're not just some random nobody and they're not going to be allowed to participate and we're just going to have them judge the games uh via some rubric or whatever you know scale that we have and they will be the uh the arbitrators of who wins in the next year as far as this year uh essentially everyone that participated is winner we got a lot of new games out a lot of playable games out for people who want to play uh stuff on their saturn uh and we just want to go ahead and redirect everyone toward the, uh fire uh service uh donation link that's down in the twitch uh panel and down in the youtube description and uh let me go ahead and copy this over uh to the chat if you want to participate as well now with that said uh competition's over uh be on the lookout for the next competition uh when i do post it i'll try to get it around the saturn's birthday but uh SXL2 said, well, they didn't even uh, bother warning anyone about the release of the Saturn, so might as well just make it a surprise. So we'll see when the next competition starts. I'm planning on making this an annual thing. Whatever Twitch money I get, I want to try and pour towards uh, stuff like this. So uh, Amazon Prime subs would be uh, appreciated to, to go toward the next year's pot. Or I guess technically this year's pot. Uh, on that note, uh, go ahead... You know, thoughts, prayers, and donations to uh, Australia. Uh, we're we're going to focus on New South Wales because that's where Professor of Race of this realm. So uh, I basically said, hey, is this donation link good? Like, uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so so that is uh, going directly toward the fire service. Now, uh, let me go ahead and switch gears. I want to go ahead and just go over. I don't know how long it would take to do this, but um, you know, if questions come up, questions come up. Uh, I want to show you guys how I put together, essentially in the space of like a week and a half or, or roughly, uh, this this contest entry for Forsaken for Plane. So what ended up happening is that my previous uh, four or so streams for Forsaken Plane got me the assets and the direction I wanted to go in, like uh, the tile sets and how I wanted the characters to look and move and act. And I had some background design work that I didn't show on stream done. But as far as the code base that I'm using right now, it's pretty much almost whole cloth redesigned from the ground up, starting around December 23rd and ending on January 1st. So it was a, it was a bit of a crunch. So let's just go through uh, in order to see uh, what what things I've added, and you can see my workflow as I as I go through this make file. Obviously, we start with the main loop, and then we see. Um, then we see uh, the TGA file. Now, this TGA file was donated to me by Ponut. He was very generous with his time, spending three days to try and explain to me how all this would load up, helping me bug check uh, my my uh, additions to it. You get it so that I can load up virtually everything on screen from Forsaken Plane uh, into the game. So what I did is before I was using uh, fully uncompressed uh, pictures, or not pictures, sprites. So if you look at, um, let me pull up one of these sprites. Okay, let's just look at the prisoner tile sheet. There we go. So we see the, see the prisoner tile sheet. Uh, essentially, each one of these pixels would be uh, 24 bits of information. So there's like 8-bit red, 8-bit uh, green, 8-bit eight, eight blue. Now, I'm not using that many colors here, but I am doing, I, I would be doing full uh, color information if I were to pass each one of those pixels individually. And you run out of room pretty quick. And that was actually the problem that we ran into when I was doing the assistant stream with uh, Cobra Dal's game, the um, Rossi's Classic. What we switched over to is Opponent's Texture Loading uh, Code, which is uh, TGA.C. What that allowed me to do is to index all these sprites, so now or all, all these pixels. So each pixel now is saying, okay, I'm color number zero, I'm color number one, I'm color number two, etc., etc., up to a palette of 64 colors. So my palette, uh, if I can find it, actually looks like uh, this. I believe this is about four or so palettes. One, two, three, four. And yeah, this is four 60, uh, 64 color palettes. So that's uh, eight by eight squares of colors. And what I can do is. No, no, no. The, the, the TGA file is the format I'm running with. I'm literally just taking 
uh, the TGA file, stripping the header out, and shoving it into uh, virtual or sorry, video memory. So the TGA file is pretty much almost uh, pure. Ponot's code. Uh, Ponot's code is doing exactly what I'm just describing: is taking the TGA file, taking the header off, and uh, using the indexes from the colors to uh, shove it into uh, video RAM. And as long as you have Okay, uh, th thanks for coming on the stream anyway, Cobra. Good night. Wait. Yeah, but... The, the... Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So go ahead and get some sleep, and then we'll... Uh, you can always just catch the rest on YouTube if you're interested. So, uh, the TGA itself. You can do an uncompressed uh, TGA and have everything be full RGB... 24-bit uh, for pixel. The... Um, the way I'm doing it is using index colors. Uh, how many bits is 64? 64 is what? 2 to the... Oh my goodness, I've lost my mind. Let me see. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. It's 2 to the 6. So it's 6 bits per pixel, essentially. The way the way we're doing it. But I don't think it gets stored like that. It's still... Yeah, yeah. It's 6, but it gets stored as, as 8, essentially. Because that's just how the... You have to discretize it. So essentially, every pixel gets stored as a, 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 an unsigned char, uh, more or less, or a single a single byte in memory. And that that's that's how it eventually ends up in memory. And that's that's how I do essentially everything. I don't do it just for the sprites though. I also use it to load up my maps. So I have a tile sheet here. There we go. So I got a tile sheet here that has uh, five ground tiles and five wall tiles. And these are all index colors as well on on, on one of the um, 64 by 64, or sorry, one of the eight by eight uh, color uh, palettes or color banks. Sorry. So the palette is the whole thing. Color bank is each uh, 64, uh, 64 color segment that I'm gonna be using one at a time to draw uh, the sprite. So when I load up the map, uh, I'd also like to go ahead and give a quick shout out to Phil Domo, who generously made this map for me while I was busy coding stuff. But uh, if if you wanted a quick cheat sheet to get uh, through for taking plane quickly, uh, you start here on the bottom left or bottom left corner. You sprint to the right and follow the curve upward. Go left, go up, go right, and avoid everything, and you'll make it to the end over here, here where the torches are. That's that that's the quick way to beat the game. Um. So all of these, uh, all these uh, pixels here represent a tile. So I'll load up the map the same way as I load up all the all the, uh, the sprites, which is a char array taken from the information from the, the uh, index TGA. Yeah, I, I, I successfully did a speed run off off stream, and then when it was time for me to showcase the game, I started to suck at it. Probably because it's it's not a good game to stream because it requires you to be slow and patient. To, uh, to make sure you don't get uh, grouped by goblins. So, you'll see uh, all these colors are actually the colors taking off of this palette over here. So there's 10 tiles. Tile, uh, or index 0 is uh, empty space. So it's black. And then we have white through black on the grayscale to give you the first 7 or so tiles. And the last 3 are these last 3 red ones. So you'll see these colors show up as, okay, here's uh, some ground... Here's some wall, here's some more wall, here's some black space, here's some different wall, and you see the little, oh, let me zoom in a little bit more. You see the uh, the little maroon bits as, oh, that's that's a specific wall tile different than the black wall tile. So yeah, so uh, I managed to, to quickly get Phil to, to figure out how to do that for me, and then I just converted the full graphic from like, a, he just gave me a BMP, and I converted it to a index TGA, and GIMP, which is a headache and a half to try and figure out how to use GIMP, which Onut also helped with. Uh, and then I can just load it up quickly into memory. And that is the purpose of this uh, TGA. Okay. So if I just load up the actual file, we can try to walk through what's going on here. So we're using uh, GFS Open, so we're kind of subverting the Joe engine uh, file loader here and going directly to the thing out of uh, SBL which 
uh, conveniently Joe Engine includes, at least this part of SBL. So we get GFS open from, out of the Sega Basic library, we uh, load in the file into memory, and we specifically, uh, based on Ponet's convention, pick a little area in front of, uh, of low working RAM. Actually, let me get a picture out. It's going to be easier to describe with a picture. So, um, what's the Saturn hardware map? I know there's a little uh, a little flowchart or diagram uh, of the Saturn hardware, so I can describe what's going on. So, okay, just give me one moment. We do Saturn low work RAM, high work RAM map. Okay, maybe I have to I have to dig into some of the documentation to find it. But essentially, uh, there's two main banks of memory that we're going to work out of. There's the high working memory, which uh, Joe Engine will work out of by default, and there's uh, low work memory, which Joe Engine doesn't even touch, and neither does SGL. So it's all free reign. So uh, Ponut uses uh, low work RAM, which starts at this address. Actually, you know where I can I can demonstrate this inside of uh, your boss or whatever you call it. Oh, I should probably build first. There we go. We got the game starting up here. Uh, let me try to expand it a little bit. Not that you really need to see the visuals for it. Normally we run in Mednefen. Mednefen has fewer errors, but your boss, or however you pronounce it, allows you to examine memory, which is its own advantage. So if you go in the memory editor, memory editor, you'll see all the different places you can you can look at the memory for. Uh, expand. There we go. So we've got uh, look at what's going on in the BIOS. We don't care about that. There's low work RAM, high work RAM, and then some other locations I'm not sure about. There's a 68K, which is its own chip. Um, Ponut's actually doing some work on that right now. And then there is uh, RAM for VDP1 and VDP2, which has its own stuff. Actually, maybe VDP2 probably doesn't have anything interesting in it, but VDP1 might have some sprites in it. Oh, there we go. There you can see the sprite. There, this is my, one of my walking animations inside of VDP1 RAM. And it just so happens that each pixel is appropriately sized in RAM to have it display like this from this display. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little, it's kind of like that, yeah. So, uh, the, the numbers themselves map to different characters in ASCII, and they come out like this, and you can kind of make out the shapes. So you see my, my tile sheet is loaded in order, so my default uh, character starts here inside of uh, video memory. Before it gets to video memory, though, it gets loaded up in low rec RAM. Of course, right now, I don't think low work RAM has anything in it that is uh, like that. Yeah, because what gets loaded in order? Let me let me check real quick. So I load uh, the HUD, ASCII, letters, character sprites, projectiles, the tile set, and then the map. Okay, so the last thing in low work memory is probably uh, the map. So all the different tiles inside the map laid out like this. And then down here after this uh, designated loading area I store the map in low work memory and that and then you see it over here I think it starts somewhere around here but it just keeps going so you see all the different non-zero tiles appear as something besides the periods of course uh, that's not as fun as looking at the, the character inside of VDP1 and maybe uh, after the character, there should be some... Oh, there's the goblin. So you can see the goblin loaded up in video memory. And, okay, let me see. And this is just something that happens 
uh, when you have when you're just loading stuff up. Even with uh, Joe Engine, that's that's how it loads up. Because it, it takes your sprite, puts it into video memory. It just so happens because I'm using index colors uh, that it comes out so cleanly looking in the video memory. And more importantly, it takes up so so little memory compared to having to store uh, probably more three times as much information essentially. Let me see if I can find some weapons in here. There might be, it might be different sizes though. So I know that my weapon, my weapon tile sheet is not 16 by 16, which is kind of what you need for, for it to show up like this. Yeah, I guess not. Maybe some of the tiles will show up. I don't know. Oh, I think this is the weapon part right now. Some of these pixels look like they're distributed like the weapons are. Yeah, it's hard to tell without actually having to work with it yourself. But yeah. So, looking at the the Saturn is just a hodgepodge of different pieces of hardware and it connected together through a big bus, and not all of them are addressable from each other. It's what I'm getting at is that uh, with with Ponut's help, I have taken all my stuff, loaded it up into the beginning of low work RAM, and then uh, moved it over. Let me see if I can find out where I defined that. There we go. My, there's my loading zone. So the first 130 kilobytes, I believe, wait, is that, no, yeah, the first 130 kilobytes of lower gram are designated as loading zones. So that's which is where I shove stuff in at first. After that, uh, all the, all the sprite information gets saved to VDP1's memory, which you guys saw. And then, uh, after, and then I start saving, uh, map information. So the map itself, this guy over here, gets loaded up. Uh, as the, those those uh, color indexes become tile indexes and get stored 130 kilobytes into uh, low work RAM, which is where I grab it from when I start drawing tiles. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So uh, that, that's that's the long and short of how this TGA loader is doing stuff. Uh, a lot of these are just checks to see if the file that you're you're get, giving it is behaving the correct way. Uh, I think one of these I actually bothered to uh, comment out because I was using it. If not, then I might have to look somewhere else. Yeah, I guess not. But essentially you see that... Uh, is this the right place? That might not be the right place. Where is... Huh. I wanted to show you where the header actually starts. Okay, so this, this is more or less showing you what's going on. So the oh, there we go. Here, image data is um, we have an ID field and then a color map field. So the color map gets stored with the TGA. We throw that out, and then there's an, uh, 18 bytes of header that uh, that we kind of just go through just to get I I information like uh, the width of the TGA, the height of the TGA, and uh, number of pixels. I forget what this. Is. What this is doing Let's see to get num number of textures oh, okay this is to tell you how many textures there there are in a certain sheet if you're mul loading multiple textures at once from one image as if it was loaded up like uh, like this sheet where there's just one texture or tile or uh, sprite after another in order so you tell it okay uh, go down 32 pixels load that as one texture and then start a new texture with the next 32 pixels. That's what that's for. So that just loads things up in there. Yeah, so that's the text table. Let me see for an individual. Oh, not the PCO. That's how you get the palette in. There, TGA. There we go. Then we just have, uh, here. We just have, start the start the image data just 18 bytes after the the, the header. And we just get the uh, whatever is in there and just kind of shove it into memory. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the I, I was corrected on on the language here. The color palette is the entire collection of color banks that you're using. That you can switch between different color banks as you're using it. Each each eight by eight color uh, bank is, is its own color bank that you can use one at a time. 
So I actually use different color banks to, to demonstrate different things. So if I... Actually, let me go ahead and run uh, Mednefen. Now, for the most part, a lot of these uh, guys are rendered with the, the first color bank. I think the tiles, I had to adjust the color bank for a different looking floor. Oh, boy. But you see, when attack goes green, I'm changing the color bank. Uh, let's go ahead. And, okay, I'm not going to actually click. But when, when, when attack goes green, run goes green... Uh, or anything like that, I'm changing the color bank to a different bank to change that color. Same with the health bar. The health bar is one sprite, and so and it's the same sprite as the magic bar, but I changed the color bank to to essentially swap the colors involved in drawing it. I could. I could do that, yes. And I have plenty of room to add many, many, many more color banks. I could probably do more than 100 color banks and still be comfortable uh, I'd have to go back and check to see how many colors I can fit. If I did smaller color banks and adjust the code to, to make up for it, then yeah, I could probably do several, several, several color banks. Probably hundreds. Yeah, so if you want an effect like the character flashes with uh, its invulnerability frames after he gets hit, then you could just make one of these color banks all white and switch to it temporarily. Just have your character flash white for a few frames. Same with uh, the ASCII letters. So I have that, that font parser that you guys saw me uh, make on the previous stream for Forsaken Plane. Let me see, is it this? Yeah, there we go. So this font, index color, just change colors number one and I believe eight or seven. Colors number one and seven. And you can make them uh, look like whatever color you want. Okay, so uh, moving on from the TJ, that's essentially what the TJ is doing, and it's the the core of the ability for me to actually make this game. On top of that, we have the uh, sprite uh, code, which all it is is just kind of a, a quick way for me to do what I need to do, which is uh, here here's load palette. Okay, we take the palette, the name of the palette, palette64.tga, we load it up at the beginning of L uh, low work RAM. Uh, load ASCII, same thing. Load it up in the work RAM, and uh, in order to figure out what I need to do, Joe Engine is still handling all the sprites. So when I load up the sprite, uh, I, I have Joe Engine uh, grab it, and it decides it a sprite ID. So I just have to save that sprite ID. So before it adds that sprite ID, I take the last sprite ID, add one to it, put it at the start of the ASCII, and then like 93 different characters get loaded up. And I just have to remember where I start and what the first uh, character code for ASCII is when I start doing that. Which, if I look it up, where is it? There we go. So my first character code is, is 33. So if I wanted, if I have uh, some character, and if you evaluate the the integer value of that character, it comes out as an ASCII table. If I can pull that up real quick. There we go. Let's see if I can load it. So the first few uh, uh, characters in Askri uh, aren't super critical, but um, all, a lot of these are formatting characters. I'm never actually going to print them on screen. Here's where I actually start at uh, number 32, right? Starting from zero. So yeah, I don't actually store space on the, the font uh, sprite sheet because there's no point. It's blank. I just skip uh, eight pixels and move on to the next uh, the next sprite. So starting at 33, uh, I say, okay, take whatever character it is, sub subtract 33 from the integer value of it, and start printing the first uh, character off of that font sheet. So in this case, I start with the exclamation point, and then I move on to double quote, then octothor. So we have exclamation point, double quote, octothor dollar sign, percent sign, ampersand, dollar sign, percent sign, ampersand. So you just do this whole table and you go down to the end of it 
Uh, I go down to Tilda. Um, let me see where, where I, if I could keep going after that. So you have uppercase, lowercase, escape to Tilda, and then delete, which is another escape character that I don't fo bother with. And then once once I'm done, um, all the characters I care about, I just make sure everything I do maps to either somewhere between 33 and 126, or I just default it to space at 33. And that's, that's the core of the font parser now. Um, the, the previous font parser kind of depended on a series of if-then checks, which is kind of a stupid way of doing it. Uh, but now, this this way, you can just build your own font table, and or at least segments of the font table, and you can just uh, print out whatever you want on screen. Yeah, yeah, this this should be... Where it's from? I believe this is from Sonic Generations. Yeah, it's just the gallery music from Sonic Generations. Which is adapted from the Sonic 3 menu music. Okay. So essentially, the, the sprite... Uh, code. All this code is available on the uh, the forum post for the competition. So if you go back to the competition uh, post on the uh, Sonic, or sorry, the Sega Extreme forums, um, you'll be able to grab this and play with it yourself. And I haven't altered it quite yet, but I plan on adding more to this game, including an online component if I can figure it out. Since I have the, all the tools and and presumably the libraries to do it. Oh, here's a uh, a nice one. I'm no longer using Joe Engine to set the sprites up. So now I can tell uh, SGL to uh, to grab the Joe Engine sprite as it's stored. So Joe Engine sprite number, and then text number is the sprite ID. And then I tell it, okay, we got a color bank based off of uh, whichever color bank, you know, zero through three, I guess, for now. And I tell it, okay, display it on screen coordinates X and Y. Uh, X and Y start at zero zero at the center. And go minus and plus. Uh, the screen itself, I believe, is 360 by 240, horizontal by vertical. So you go half of 360 left or right, and then half of 240 up or down. And then for the the Z value, you want to give it a. Um, I believe I'm giving it a fixed. So uh, whatever number I give it, it's just going to get shifted to fixed. Uh, for the most part, I believe everything has to be past 100 and less than some big number like 500 or something like that. And the closer to the screen you are, the smaller your number is. So when I display the HUD, uh, where is it? Is that under menu? There you go. There's print fix ASCII. Uh, okay, that's, that's just me printing numbers on the screen. So I take a fixed, the fixed itself is a, uh, is a difficult format to work with, and I parse it out to make it so that I have the integer part and the decimal part print out on screen using that sprite ASCII parser. Print in ASCII is something similar but easier. There we go. Load HUD, draw HUD. When I draw the HUD, I have, um, well, I, I print out some, some lettering, and I'm able to change the color of lettering based off of uh, certain flags. So when the player is attacking, I change to color bank 3, otherwise I'm on color bank 0. Same with, uh, with when I'm, uh... oh, this is weird. This is not the way it's supposed to ha to work. This is, a, this is a bug. This should be based off of whether or not I'm, I'm casting a spell, not whether or not my, my magic is above 0. This is weird. Uh, I'll, I'll fix that later. Actually, maybe this is not wrong. Maybe uh, if my magic goes to zero, it should it should go to uh, greed out. Maybe I was thinking of something else. So th no, this is correct. But uh, just I would pay attention to uh, what I was trying to bring up earlier, which is the um, Z level, which over here is one ten. So I believe all the all the ASCII characters get printed on level 100 or so, and then the HUD, HUD's at 110 and everything else is behind it. So when I print the actual character, uh, when do I draw the character? Uh, that's probably it's probably under character.c. When I draw the character itself, it's load character, get attribute, character, lerp offset, move character. Um, 
Ah, uh, that's not that. Attack? Do I draw? Oh, there we go. Draw a player. When I draw the player, I draw them at the center of the screen, more or less, with a little bit of an offset because the top left corner of the sprite is not the center of the sprite. Um, I draw him on level 150. However, I draw the weapon on level 149, and the weapon sprite itself is drawn in such a way to uh, not overlap the, the player character at all. So, if uh, the weapon is in front of me, the full weapon is is drawn on is on the sprite, and that way it, it gets drawn on top of the the character because the the Z level is closer to I guess the camera or the player or what have you. For the uh, weapons that are facing away, with this code as written, they would get drawn on top of the character, which wouldn't make a lot of sense in terms of just depth. So what I do is I draw the weapons with chunks missing and make sure that they fit the sprites. So in this case, this this is the top of the sword. When you swing up, you don't see the hilt or anything like that because it's supposed to be behind the character. Uh, same thing with, okay, you swing with your right arm. So on the right, you see the hilt of the sword. On the left, when you're facing left, your right arm is behind uh, the character on the sprite. So you don't see the hilt on the right. And this is most apparent with things like, here's, here's the sword that takes chunks out for the head and the body. So you don't see the, the upswing as much as you see the downswing. And then for the bow, it gets uh, really weird because I take out chunks of the bow so you can see the hands as if it's holding the bow. But if you go look backward, huge chunks of the bow are missing because they're supposed to be behind the player sprite. And you're supposed to see bits of the bow from between the, the pixels on the player. And then the left and the right are definitely drawn for the same reasons. Uh, and it's it's not that apparent with the the long arm or the, the the spear or whatever you want to call it, but there it is. So uh, just just with all these sprite tools, you could probably take this code and make a decent two D game out of whatever you want. You just have to figure out your own physics or how things are moving around. I specifically went with a tile based game because it's it's a pretty quick and easy way to prototype and, and play. And I don't know if I want it. I need to stick with it. I feel like if I do uh, move away from tile-based games, it's going to be harder to take online, and it's going to get slow down everything. Because right now, I've got an AI system that takes into account 250-some actors. Because I, I load the, the map with 256 enemies. So, actually, let's go ahead and go over the actual uh, statistics and how the characters act. So, the character structure uh, has... Basically stuff for, for everything that you care about doing. Uh, whether or not it's active, so whether or not you need to care about it or do any checks on it. You got your name, which at some point will be editable. And there, there is uh, a character ID, which you're going to use to keep track of uh, who's doing what. Sprite ID, obviously for what you're drawing. And then because the sprite ID is as the, the start of your sprite sheet, if you turn a direction, you can add some fixed number to that sprite ID and get the correct sprite. So that's how you orient on the on the draw command, which I believe is apparent. No, it's probably it's here actually. Draw PC. Draw character, a player. There we go. So we do player sprite plus uh, three times player direction because there's three sprites per direction for the for the player character or for any character in this game so far. And then uh, whatever tile offset we set. So during the walk animation, we can give it an offset of one or two to go to left step or right step. So um, we store the color bank for the player character, or for whatever character we're doing, to tell it what, what color we actually want to use to, to draw the sprite. Remember, we're using index sprites. Uh, we have obviously uh, map coordinates. Uh, radius is as of yet unimplemented, but it's essentially or hitbox radius, in case I want to do bigger enemies. Uh, I got the direction for south, north, east, and west, in the order that the sprites are drawn. I have a boolean flag for whether or not we're moving, so you can walk animation, attacking, so you can stop yourself from mooning, uh, running to double your, your animation speed and walk speed. And then I have uh, animation tracking to figure out, you know, what frame do I need to draw which sprite at. And then I have uh, an attack timer to try and slow down or speed up attacks, but depending on the attack delay. 
And then obviously you've got your vital statistics, HP, MP. You have an MP recovery rate. Uh, I think that this might not be implemented. I think I do that separately via attributes. Uh, you've got an, a weapon slot and an armor slot. And uh, you can cycle through the weapon slot, which is equipped zero by pressing that inventory button. And then here you store all the skills. So the skills are like I showed you on the pause screen when I showed off the game. You have uh, five different weapon skills, a uh, single armor skill, and then six different magic skills, most of which are unimplemented, uh, exception being creation. So uh, the idea is whenever you use a skill, you uh, either successfully, you either have a success or a failure, and that will give you a certain experience bonus. So uh, I take care of that with uh, an experience table. The experience is proportional to one over the level. So if you have a level one skill, you'll get um, a lot more experience than if you have a level five skill for the same success. And then uh, experience one and experience two tells you how much we're shifting to grant that experience. So in this case, one over one becomes, um, where is it? There we go. One over two to the three for, um, for a success and one over two to the six for a failure, which I believe is one over eight and one over 64. So if you have eight successes, uh, for a given skill, then you should level up from level one to level two. And then after that, it becomes harder, uh, for, uh, for failures, you have to have 64 failures in order to get the same effect. And that is taken care of in the, uh, the damage object. So the damage code itself is essentially like having a tile responsible for interacting with uh, another, with some character. So I have a character struct and then I have a damage struct. And the damage struct uh, has a bunch of flags on it. And it also has the uh, ID of the owner. So you can increment experience on the owner. So you can create a damage and you have to implement all the, uh, all the, uh, properties of that struct. We have whether or not it's active, whether or not it needs to be killed on the next frame, which is basically make the, uh, damage, uh, tile disappear. We have the sprite ID, which is for the most part, not there unless we're drawing a bow. So when you, when you, um, when you shoot the bow, an arrow comes out, and that arrow has a sprite. Otherwise, the damage tile are more or less invisible. They're just on top of where your weapon sprite is being drawn. And then we have, uh, obviously, the color bank. Anytime we want to draw something, we have the owner, as I described before. And then we have a damage type, which uh, doesn't really do much right now, but kind of tells you what's going on with it. So I right now, I only use it to, to, to say that, oh, I got a projectile, so this thing has to move. And then there's uh, a magic type, which again, doesn't really do much except for the creation tree, which puts a damage. When you press the heal spell button, you put a damage tile on top of yourself for negative damage, which automatically goes through. And then uh, we have uh, the experience handler. So skill type, zero for weapon, one for armor, two for magic, and then the number on that skill. So you find out which element on that array is going to get uh, filled out. So you, when a damage is uh, updated and evaluates, let me see if I can find, there we go, damage character. So damage character is any interaction between damage and character, including healing. So uh, it needs to overlap the character. So it, the damage child needs to be on top in some fashion, uh, the character. If, um, If uh, the, the the game right now places a special significance on the the player right now, so the player is considered an ID of negative one for the owner. Uh, that's going to change once this the game becomes uh, multiplayer, where I'm going to just have a, a separate uh, set of indices for the players and uh, whatever enemies are on screen. Uh, we have uh, if the owner is greater than or equal to zero, then we're going to go through the NPCs and see which NPC this belongs to. 
So if the value is less than or equal to zero, we automatically allow it to go through. And then we allow the source of that healing to gain experience based off of that event happening as a success. So that uh, is evaluated with the experience. Um, the experience uh, function. You can see here that uh, with that negative value, we are adding or essentially, okay, so we flip we flip the sign, and then we have this uh, DHP, this delta HP, the change in HP, which gets converted from a fixed from the value down to an integer using this uh, right 16 shift. And then, uh, obviously, we have to kill the, uh, the damage tile once it's done doing its job so that it doesn't uh, continue to exist at that spot, continue uh, operating. Oh, here we have uh, a damage check. So we have uh, a defense check, which, let me see, that is 1.5 tight dexterity plus the armor plus 5.5 of the defending target. So you take whatever the defending target is character X, you get X's uh, dexterity attribute, which is attribute number 5, and then the armor is uh, just armor skill, zero at zeroth entry, the only entry there. And then this this would be the fixed version of 5.5, which is 5.5 bit shifted left 16. This number over here is 1.5 bit shifted left 16, being multiplied by dexterity. Uh, you're going to have a damage reduction, which is um, uh, your armor skill plus one quarter of your toughness, which doesn't account for much un up until you level up one or both of those. Then uh, the damage has a minimum of of essentially one. So uh, your damage reduction gets uh, subtracted away from your armor and a bit shifted to the right 16 to turn it into an integer. And then if that is less than, um, essentially, if, if that becomes greater than negative one, which is to say you take less than one damage, then you pin it to one damage. Otherwise, this thing will be a highly negative number, like minus five or so, which is kind of what you normally expect when you play the game the first time when you're at level one. And then uh, with this successful check, you say, okay, the experience... Uh, should for the source should go up based off of the skill type and the skill number and that's going to give you that 1 8th experience or 1 over x it shifted um, right 3 times experience and then well okay that's evaluated true true means success and then the source is going to have his armor experience incremented by a failure one time if there's a successful defense we, we flip those uh, booleans. So now you get failed uh, experience on the source of damage based off the skill type the damage came from, which is why it's stored on the damage. And then uh, your armor gets incremented uh, by a successful experience. And then, of course, again, we kill the damage tile if it gets evaluated. Uh, after that, we evaluate the, the change in hit points based off of hit points plus delta hit points. Uh, it cannot go lower than zero. It cannot get higher than max hit points, is which we do when you uh, retrieve a get attribute character X for number zero. Uh, on, yeah, on the same note, a get attribute one would be uh, the maximum magic points, which is what makes your magic recovery not go over the cap. Uh, oh, here, here's the game over screen. So essentially, once, once you lower down once your hit points at zero or you hit the end of the stage you will uh get a game over this will uh essentially temporarily turn off your your inputs and then start resetting uh all your skills down to whatever energy level they are so that's accomplished with this uh bitwise and so is it? yeah bitwise and so with the bottom 16 bits set to zero, that means any of your decimal portions of the fix that represent your skills get set to zero. So that's what this line is doing. And we're looping through all five weapon skills, the armor skill, and all six magic skills. So if you die or you get to the end of the stage, uh, your your levels get, get bottomed out or floored down to their uh, previous integer level. And then initialize NPCs. 
re-randomizes all the enemies in the dungeon. So the enemies are randomly placed so that they're on a walkable tile, but they're not on top of each other, and they're not within a certain distance of the spawn point, which is uh, stored as map X, map Y. Okay. Uh, health and, and MP are reset to, to go back to what they were, so this is uh, HP is now equal to max HP, MP is equal to max MP. And uh, player gets shifted back to where he started, and then we restart the game over condition and allow the game to continue. Of course, this is, this is all triggered by uh, the player play, pressing the start button after the game over comes up. So you get to see game over there up until the point that uh, you press uh, start. Which is what you see when you die. I mean, when you die in, in game, not die. I don't know what you, you're going to see when, when you kick the bucket in real life. Um, probably a cat playing piano or something. What else have I not gone over? Oh, um, NPC template has some AI in it. So let's go over the AI real quick, and then I think I'll close up shop for the night. It's been a, it's gonna be a quick stream, but I just want to go over real quick what all the uh, the code did for my submission. Uh, so uh, the NPC templates, we have uh, the dagger goblin, and he has a uh, we we set his equipment to one, so he's got a dagger equipped or a small blade essentially. Uh, they all get their NPC times. Uh, their attack times are, are delayed to, I believe, one second. So they can only attack one second at a time. You have a little bit of a fighting chance. Um, Dagger Goblins start out with ones in all skills. They are just good at stabbing. Uh, the enemies in this game do gain experience. So if you let them, as long as you don't die and they, everything gets reset, you could have one of these goblins uh, keep attacking you and level up their, their weapon skill uh, up until the point where they can become... A serious threat and you wouldn't be able to fight them anymore. Uh, the sword goblin is going to be particularly tough, not because of his weapon skill, because of his armor skill. Um, his, his armor skill is 5, which means uh, you're not doing very much damage at all as you hit him, and uh, you're kind of just more or less trying to hit for 1 or 2 or 3 at a time until he dies. And because he has a high armor skill, he's got high toughness, which means his hit points are probably being enhanced. Uh, his weapon skill, the sword skill, is associated with uh, strength and uh, toughness. Actually, let me go back and just show you how these attributes are calculated. So hit points, uh, everything is based off attributes, and the attributes themselves are based off of uh, skills. So uh, for one example, just to go in depth, and I'll just list all the others. For your strength, it's primarily... Uh, your fist skill and your long blade skill with some help from your heat magic skill which is not yet implemented so what i do is i take one and then i take uh one quarter of your weapon skill or one quarter of your fist skill one quarter of your long blade skill as the primary skills and then uh one eighth of your secondary skills which in this case is heat which is stuck at one so, uh, essentially, primaries, one quarter of your primary uh, skill gets uh, added to, to whatever you have for your, um, your associated attribute, and your secondary skill, one-eighth of it gets added. So, for toughness, you have armor, followed by long blades, and uh, cold. For perception, which is what you use for bows, it's associated with bows, long arms, with uh, electric uh, magic as a secondary. Uh, dexterity, you use for small blades, primarily, with uh, secondary associations from uh, fist weapons, long arms, and armor. Empathy has no primaries, but it uses creation magic as a secondary. Uh, I'm, once, once the game has more features and you're able to talk to NPCs and stuff like that, empathy will have uh, more associated skills. Uh, Guile is associated with Psychic Magic and Gravity Magic, with a secondary of Small Blades. Intelligence has Heat Magic and Cold Magic, and uh, as a secondary Gravity Magic, meaning that there's no way in the current uh, version of the game to uh, level up Intelligence. Uh, memory is associated with electrician, Electricity Magic and Creation Magic, with a secondary in Psychic Magic. Uh, creation Magic 
is basically the only way to increase your memory. And then luck is the sum of all your attributes divided by 8. Um, right now, the way creation magic is implemented, it doesn't really matter what your creation magic skill is. It just helps out a little bit with your uh, ma magic points. So your MP is twice your memory, plus your guile, plus half your intelligence. Your HP is 7 plus 5 times your toughness, plus 2 times your strength, plus 3 quarters of your luck. Which, once you get up everything maxed out to levels 128, should give you 999 hit points. Uh, I might have made a mistake there, I'm not sure, but I think that's correct. Uh, your MP recovery. I think I implemented that last minute as part of the main loop. So that was kind of like a slapped on over here. There we go. MP recovery looks like it is what? Uh, what's attribute 8? Let's go back and check real quick. Good attribute. So attribute 8 is intelligence, so, uh, mana recovery, uh, is per second, uh, 1 eighth of intelligence and 1 16th of, I believe that's guile. Yeah. One eighth intelligence, one sixteenth guile is recovered by as mana per second. Okay. So now you have a better uh, view of how the the skills work in for second plane. You see that the sword goblin is more of a tank than anything. Now we have a bow goblin who is highly offensive. Uh, has uh, a, a three attack skill for his his bow weapon, and. Uh, an armor skill of two. This might be a little bit high considering the bow is is a very advantageous weapon in the current build of the game. Um, the spear goblin presumably would be a very difficult uh, enemy because he's got five weapon skill and three armor. However, he's very easy to maneuver into. Oh, uh, no. I, I don't have Guile Seam on the playlist, but uh, maybe I'll add that at some point. Okay, so I promised I was going to get into AI. Uh, where is the AI? Oh, it's in its own class. I forgot. AI. There we go. So we have a distance function, which tells you how far away you are from some character. In this case, it's almost always going to be a check against the player character. And then there's a line of sight. Now, this is important for spearmen and, and bows. Well, yeah, Guile is one of the uh, the attributes, so, you know... It's, it's going to get said a lot when I discuss how the, the stats work. So, the line of sight tells you if you are on the same line of tiles, either the same X value or the same Y value, as whoever you're checking against, in this case the NPC is checking against the player, then you have line of sight, and then you can start thinking about what you want to do while you're on the same tile, uh, tile line. So that's important for bows because the bows only shoot up and uh, up, down, left, and right. And obviously weapons only go up, down, left, and right, but you need adjacent weapons. Uh, but a spear can attack two tiles away. So if you have a line of sight equal to two in some direction, uh, that's where you actually want to be hitting with your spear if you have a spear. So... We are, we're basically just take the X and DY, absolute value thereof, and um, assuming that D, one, either DX or DY are on are, are zero, which means you're on the same line as, as whoever you're checking against, you'll return the maximum value for the other one, telling you, okay, if both of you have the same X value, but you're two tiles away from the, from, from each other, it'll return two. If you're not on the same line of sight, what it'll do is it'll tell you the minimum distance it would take for you to walk to get onto your line of sight. So, uh, there, and then the distance is exactly what you expect it to be. It's just a distance function. So, x squared plus y squared square root. So, now we get to go through NPC AI. So, what we do is for every NPC, every frame, uh, well, not every frame. Every time the, the, the NPC is active and available to act. Uh, which is not always. Uh, the, the... Let's see. 
Yeah, so if the character is available, meaning he's not walking, he's not attacking, he's not doing something, he's just ready to act, then uh, also it needs to be within um, 13 tiles of the player via distance function. So assuming all those things, which is how I kind of reduce the overhead of this, basically you have to be near a player in order for the NPC AI to trigger. Once you're near a player within 13 tiles or so, weird background. Oh, it's PSU, it's always that. It's always PSU that goes weird. So, once you're within that, that given distance, you can uh, you essentially start calculating distances from the player based off of offsets from your current location. So I want to see, okay, I know where my distance is. I want to know where the distance is for to my left, to my right, above me, and below me. And the same thing, I want to figure out if there's if my line of sight or if any adjacent lines of sight are able to hit the player. And that will affect different types of enemies different ways. Uh, another thing you need is uh, whether what direction the player is in. So basically, north, south, east, or west. So, if you are a bowman and you say, okay, I'm on the proper line of sight, head toward the player's direction, and fire. So that's what that's just these two lines. So you switch the direction of the NPC and then you attack. Okay. If you're not on that line of sight, you want to get to that line of sight. So you go through all those line of sight calculations you just did and you say, "Okay. If um, my target right now is 20, which is uh, basically saying uh, 20 tiles away from the character." That's just a, a default high value so that I can uh, increment lower. So if I see a tile that has um, that has a, 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 if I see an adjacent tile that has a line of sight that allows me to get closer to the player. So basically a positive line of sight. Then I will then I will move to that as long as that, that tile is closer to the target than not. Um, let's see. This this looks like it might be broken. I'm not sure. It looks like it looks like it works in the game, but based on the math, it doesn't feel like it works. Maybe I, I read the line of sight code wrong. Let me, let me double check. Line of sight should return the maximum if you are on the line of sight and minimum negative if you're away from the line of sight. So if you're not on the line of sight, then basically you'd expect most of these guys to return negative or hmm. Oh, oh, I see what's going on. So if you have an adjacent tile that is guaranteed a line of sight, you go toward that tile. Otherwise, you move in the direction of the player. So the direction is already set by facing the player up here. Uh, if there is a line of sight tile next to you that you can move to, then you go in that direction instead as opposed to moving toward the player. I'm not sure if that really makes a lot of sense in terms of how I coded it, but it still works out. So uh, once, you're, once you've moved there, then you'll uh, eventually go through this this whole check again if you're the bowman and you'll eventually get to a positive line of sight location at which point you will attempt to attack the player and that's when you shoot the arrow okay uh, case number four so if your weapon equipped is uh, is weapon number four that's the long arm what you want to do is you want to get a line of sight equal to two which means you are two tiles away from the player and then you head face the player and attack and then two tiles away he will get hit by the damage child created by your spear if you are not within two tiles, what you will do is you will try to move to a place that has uh, two tiles of line of sight to it. Now, you will really quick check for a tile adjacent to you that is two tiles of line of sight away. If that is not available, then you'll just move toward the player. Okay. Uh, the default AI is just uh, trying to get line of sight of one on the player and attacking. And if that doesn't work, then try to minimize the distance between you and the player for the next tile that you move to. And that's the AI, and it was, it's actually pretty simple to set it up this way. 
And it still creates a dynamic enough behavior where the game is difficult and the enemies are still coming after you. Uh, I didn't go over real quick the, the direction, face the direction of the player, but essentially if it defaults to um, if DX, if, if the difference in, in your coordinates between the player and yourself, or whatever your target is and yourself, are greater in X than Y, then you'll face either East or West, whichever way is facing uh, the, the target. So if, if the target has a greater uh, X than, what, than whatever um, place you're probing, that means they're to the east of you, which means you want to face east, which is uh, index number two on my directional system. Otherwise, you face three. If dy is less than dx, that means he's closer north-south than he is east-west. So you default north, uh, which is uh, value one on my directional map, unless dy is uh, positive, in which case you want to put south. Because y goes positive to negative from down to up. Or rather, top of the screen is negative y, bottom of the screen is positive y. I mean, that's that's the majority of the game. That's the nuts and bolts of how the game is put together. Obviously, there's a timer. If you go back to Scenario on a stream, I believe that is called The Secret to Great Comedy. You'll find out how the timer is put together. Uh, I've gone over NPC template, damage, AI. Uh, the input... The input is not really great. I need to work on it. But essentially... I take uh, Joe Engine inputs and I parse it using these uh, inline. Uh, they're, they're not conditional statements. I forget what they're called. Uh, essentially, you could do a single line if statement, and I nested a couple of them. I said, okay, uh, zero means we're not pressing anything. Minus one means we just lifted the button off. So we just stopped pressing the button. Uh, if we just press the button right now, it's uh, number one. And if if the button has been held for a while, it's two. And basically that means anything above zero means the button is being pressed. Anything below zero or lower or equal to zero means the button's not being pressed or has at least just been let go of. And depending on whether or not you just press the button or you've been holding the button, you might want different uh, behavior for that. Like if you just press the start button, expect the money to pop up. But if you check against holding the start button, that means every frame you're holding the start button, it's going to trigger that behavior and over and over again. So essentially, you're probably going to end up flashing the menu on and off over and over again, instead of just waiting for a time when the button is freshly pressed. Uh, similarly, with run, you you want to hold down run in order for that to happen. So you just check for anything about zero. Uh, so it doesn't it doesn't really matter if you need uh, if you pressed it or if you just held it down. For things like attack, you just listen for. Uh, a new button press as long as your attack animation has gone through. I don't think it really matters if it's a, a press or hold. I feel like hold might be a little less interactive. I think you want to make the player press the button that every time he's manually doing something in order to make that attack happen. You don't want to just hold down a button and just wait. You want to kind of make the player mash the button to get more engaged in the game. Um, I don't think I do anything with left or right trigger, so I don't know why that's there. I didn't bothered but it is more like a universal setup i also have support for diagonals upper left upper right down left down right but i don't think i use them in this game but uh, the code base is there in case i need it so that is forsaken plane in its current state i will be working on this game more uh i do plan on slowing down a bit at least for the next six months i'm coming toward the tail end of a phd i gotta defend i have to finish up all my obligations here before I move on you know, my next stage in life. I got a new job, a new location. So what I plan on doing is one long monthly stream uh, for at least the next six, seven, eight months or so, as opposed to my target of weekly streams, which I end up skipping anyway because my life is too busy. So uh, plan on long monthly streams, probably like the first weekend of the month, where I'll try to do, you know, much more than just like the one hour stream I just did today. Uh, I believe that uh, for the my birthday that's coming up next weekend, I will be doing a long uh, art uh, birthday, another 3D birthday blast like last year. And this time I will be trying to do art assets for everyone that entered the uh, 20, Sega that Saturn 25th anniversary game competition that we covered at the beginning. Okay. 
So, uh, if you were entered in that contest, I would like to see you, uh, Saturday. Not this Saturday, not tomorrow. Next Saturday. For the 3D Birthday Blast, you can request art assets, and I will deliver. I do my best to do so. Uh, you guys have seen me in Blender. Uh, Saturn Day, yeah, sure. Saturn Day will be the 3D Birthday Blast. The, uh, 18th? Yes. No? Yes, 18th. Okay, the 18th. So, uh, you've seen me use Blender, you've seen me use uh, Paint.net. I think, I, you haven't seen me use GIMP, but I could use GIMP a little bit now. Uh, I will do my best to make whatever art assets are requested. Uh, priority, of course, goes to the contest entrance because I promised fourth place, which everyone is every place now, so everyone gets to get a piece of the action, I guess. Uh, if no one is interested in making art assets, I'll take requests, and either you can use it in your game or I'll try using it in my game. Um, after that, I will be focusing on trying to get Forsaken Plane multiplayer and online with more features. Uh, implement the magic system fully, uh, probably into implement more weapons, uh, more inventory options, obviously more dungeons, more locations, and try to improve the graphics a bit, make the game overall more playable. So, uh, that's about it for today. Uh, there weren't too many questions, uh, except I guess from Shane occasionally and Diddy. Uh, if, uh, so uh, I'll look forward to seeing you guys um, the January 18th when I do the, the long form uh, 3D birthday blast, which I think is going to be like an annual thing, just like the Sega Saturn game competition. So uh, if no one has uh, anything to say in chat, then I'm going to go ahead and sign out for the day. Uh, normally I try to raid a channel, but with just two people right now on stream, I think everyone's already left. Uh, I'm not going to bother. So uh, good night, everyone. Uh, everyone who's seeing me on YouTube, I guess.